All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Course Creator Community Podcast. I am super excited because we've got an absolute rock star on the line this week. Now, I know I say that about every guest every week, but this person actually is because she's a return um, person on the podcast. I, You've been listening to this podcast. You know, that most of the guests are pretty good, but the ones that are awesome, I bring on a second time. So this person fits in the, the awesome category. Her specialty is all around music teachers. She helps music Music teachers add an additional thousand dollars to their monthly revenue in ninety days or less uh, in the online world. So, without further ado, let me introduce the one and only Jamie Slutsky. Jamie, how are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me back. This is going to be such a fun, you know, repeat conversation, but it's going just that much deeper. I love it. Awesome. No, I'm excited now. If people missed the first episode, Jamie, because it was about a year ago, so a lot of people probably haven't heard of it, uh, give us a bit of a rundown. What is it you actually do? Okay, sure. So basically what I do is I help music teachers create their online courses. And I do this through a multitude of ways. And, you know, some of my clients, they want a handholding from the idea phase all the way through the launch and delivery phase. Other clients are like, I know what I want to create and I need help with the tech because I come to this space from a technology side of things. I have my degree in computer science, spent over a decade in corporate IT, and I have been helping professionals and freelancers and entrepreneurs online for over a decade as well. So I kind of know the user experience side of things and making sure that people are creating the right course for their audience. Awesome. And you do it via one-on-one or group coaching or courses, memberships, all of the above? Almost all of the above. I should have all of the above (laughs) at some point in time. Um, Mostly one-on-one and group. Um, I've got a group uh, coaching program that I do with a business partner. And it's the online music course accelerator because, you know, you got to go meta with these things. It's really obvious and easy (laughs) to describe it. And then we also have a course that's more along just the getting started with social media and email marketing because that's relevant to music teachers who want to be able to create a course, but need to get their feet wet, making sure that they're creating regular income through online channels first. So those are the kind of ways we do things. Yes. Now, if you're listening to this and you are a music teacher, Jamie has her own podcast. I recommend checking it out. The Music Teachers Expand Online podcast. If you're not a music teacher, it's probably still good. It's obviously tailored for for music teachers. But if you're listening to this and you want to get an idea of what's going on in the the music world as well, you know, obviously go ahead and check that out. I'll put the link down in the show notes. Uh, Let's dive into it, Jamie. I'll set a scenario for you. Because okay. there'll be a lot of people listening to this who are in that music space. They're okay. guitar players or, you know, um, piano teachers or, you know, they teach I don't know something at school around singing or, or whatever it may be. Uh, they've obviously heard about an online course. They want to do an online course. That's why they're listening to, to this podcast here. But they're in the early stages. Mm-hmm. Do you want to walk through step by step? What's What's the first thing that person should do? The first thing they should do is hire me. No, I'm kidding. (laughs) I'm kidding. (laughs) I actually am really kidding. And the first thing that you want to do is make sure that you are creating a course that you want to create and that there is a market for. So market research is one of the most important things that so many people miss when they are starting to create an online course because they're like, oh, well, I love teaching this. Mm. So I'm going to create a course that does this. And that's just not the way it works online because there are thousands of course creators. So you want to start building your market and doing the market research to find your angle. Because every single teacher, I don't care if you are a beginner piano teacher or you're another beginner piano teacher, you have the same fundamentals. The reason why someone works well with one teacher versus another is their approach. It's their cadence of their voice. It's the methodology. It's the way that they can relate to the teacher and all of that. So it's not enough to say, I have a good idea. It's really a matter of making sure that you're creating a market that wants 
that course and wants to learn from you in that way. So that is absolutely the first thing to do is to understand that you may have 4,000 ideas and one of them is the right one to start with. Love it. How do we find out? How do we do our market research? How do we know this course is going to sell? You got to be curious. You've got to ask questions. You've got to meet your prospective students where they are. You, you know, if you're excited on Instagram, then go on Instagram and be curious and look and find people who are posting about their piano struggles or their guitar struggles or their wins or things like that and reach out to them. You can't just passively learn this stuff. You have to have active conversations. And the same thing over on Facebook. If you're in Facebook groups, then find out what people are asking. Like there's going to be people asking all the time for basics and for advanced concepts and things like that. Start lending your voice. Start being seen in these communities so that when you do ask a question saying, would you be interested in a course on this? People would be like, oh, yeah, that's somebody who's active in this community. I'm going to answer their question. You can't just drop your question in and hope that everyone answers it because they're in this group. Build relationships. That's the key is to build the relationships so that you're creating and you have a support system right there. Love it. So I think there's a a few points there. I think here it kind of depends whether you have a following or not, right? I feel if you've already got a following of your ideal people, you know, you've got whatever students, ex students, you've been posting tips on social anyway, you know, if you've, if you've already got that, this stage seems a little bit easier, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And so that's where you go back to your students and you Mm -hmm. look at what you've done with your students. And this is actually one of my favorite things to say is, is there something you've done with 90% or 80% of your students in the past year that you did one-on-one every single time, Mm. that might be your course. Like you're going into your anecdotal information to pull out that idea for a course. I call those um, prerequisite courses. Like those are courses that are a student would be required to take before they can graduate to online lessons with you or in-person lessons with you because they're fundamental concepts that you want to make sure that they all have. So yeah, if you have students already, look at what you do with your students so that you can extract the parts that are lather, rinse, repeat type stuff. Love that. And then I think if you don't have an audience, you kind of gave two examples there, uh, Instagram and Facebook. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, yeah, the way I, I kind of look at that, I think the important thing, as Jamie mentioned, is you need to have these conversations, you need to do the market research. Because I think what a lot of people do in this situation is go out and build the course first, where it's like, as you mentioned, right, I've got this thing, I want to go and build this thing, go out and build the course. Uh, and then there's, and then you've got the course finished, but you've got no one following you. You know, there's kind of mm-hmm. two issues there. Number one is you've got no one following you. So you've got no one to market to. So then you need to go out and, you know, do build your following. But the issue with that is maybe when you build your following, you realize that the course you've got isn't necessarily what they want. So mm-hmm, then mm-hmm. now you've built this following and now you realize this course isn't what they want. And you're kind of stuck in two things there because a lot of the time you probably spent months, if not a year creating this course and all this time and energy and money, and you don't want to throw it away. You know, you kind of right. committed now nah, I've put all this effort, putting it together. I'm going to keep trying to shove it down these people's throats, even though they don't want it. And it just gets really, really messy. And then what will happen is eventually you won't sell and then you'll create a new one and you've just wasted all this time. So it's so much kind of easier to do it the other way. Be like, right, I got this course ID before I go and start creating this thing. Right. Let me jump on Instagram. Let me find some people. Let me ask some questions. Let me build a following. Okay, great. Now I'll put it together. Still, then there's no guarantee. You still might launch right. and it might not sell, but you're in a way better position than if you just didn't do any, any of that there. So I think that's cool. Uh, and then you also mentioned Facebook groups, which I think is an amazing one as well. And I think there's a few things going on there because I've also got a big Facebook group for um, fitness professionals. And one of two things happens there, right? A lot of the time people will say, hey, Jono, you know, can I make a post in your Facebook group? If I like the person, you know, and they've they've kind of built a relationship with me, I'll allow Mm -hmm. it. 
Uh, but if my audience doesn't know, like I got 17,000 people in that Facebook group. But if my audience doesn't know that person or my person doesn't know my audience, they'll make a post and they will get zero likes, comments, inquiries, mm-hmm. anything, right? Um, whereas if I was to do it and just tweak it a little bit and because you know my people know me and I know them, it would have got a heap of traction. So I think right. that's an important point there. It's not... Um, it's not a matter of, right, here's this Facebook group. I can just go in this Facebook group and post. I'm going to get all this traction. Doesn't work like that, right? You've got to build <laughs> the, um, the the equity in there, the relationship equity in there. Yes. Right? Uh, the other thing as well is sometimes people just go in my Facebook group and post, and it might be a good one, but if it's just a straight up promotion and they haven't asked me, I delete them and ban them from the group. So that's the other yeah. thing to keep in mind from a Facebook group as well. Even if you have a good idea and you go in there and, and post it, if that group doesn't allow it, they can just ban you and you, you're gone from there. But let's use that same scenario. Let's say that person, you know, was a good member of the group. Let's say they kissed my butt a little bit, you know, gave me some compliments, <laughs> you know, liked my stuff and, you know, um, and then came to me, said, hey, John, I've got this thing. Do you mind if I post it? I might have allowed it, you know, or I might right. have allowed it and charged them. Or even if I let them did it for free and it got a really good um, result, I might have come back and said, hey, it looks like you got a really good result. Do you mind promoting something of mine to your person? Like, so I think it's in, another important thing there. It's not just a matter of he's a he's this big group with 10,000 people. Oh, I can plug my stuff in there. There's a little bit more to it than that. Reciprocity is such a valuable commodity. <laughs> that is like the, in, in a nutshell is that when we go into a Facebook group, we have to remember that the admin of that group, they have poured more energy mm. into that group than anybody else. And so if we have respect for that person, they are going to be able to be much more likely to have respect for us. And I think that with course creation, it's so powerful because when you build a relationship with the person who runs that group, maybe during your launch, they would might become an affiliate for you. Maybe for a second or a third launch, they do a JV partnership with you, you know, a joint venture partnership where like they're going to do a bunch of the promotion and it's your content. And there are so many doors that open when we lead with generosity um, and are not net takers. Yes. Love that. hundred <laughs> um, percent. Should we go deeper there? Now let's move on from there. So, <laughs> So first thing this uh, musician or music teacher does is they do their market research. They're either on Instagram, they're on Facebook, they're speaking to some people. Now they've got a bit of an yep. idea that, you know, yeah, a few people have asked me this. I'm seeing this question come up. You know, what's what's kind of the next step from there? The next step is to figure out where you want to take them. Because with lessons, and I'm, you know, this is really specific to the music space. Most people they hire a teacher for lessons and it's a one-on-one relationship. And it's like, Oh, what do we want to work on today? And it might be, you know, okay, what do we want to work on next week? But it's not like we have a goal that is set out at the outset. You know, you don't hire a a music teacher at the beginning of January and say, okay, where are we going to be in December? You know, it doesn't quite work the same way. So we have to get really specific about where do we want to take these students? What is going to be that, that big goal that we're going to be able to help them achieve. Are they going to be able to sight read music? Are they going to be able to shift keys? I mean, like I'm not a music teacher. I've not played a musical instrument since like eighth grade band, but I know that it's so important to get specific about the end goal because then we can build the student journey. We start with the end goal and then we figure out, how are we going to get there? What was their starting point? What is the minimum requirements that the student needs in order to be able to, for me to get them to the end goal with an asynchronous course? Because courses mean that there's not any necessarily any live interaction with the Mm -hmm. teacher. The curriculum is already created and the student goes through it. So we have to really just kind of change the way we think. I mean, and you know, even in the fitness space, I can, you know, I can talk about that. I mean, at one point in time, I was a personal trainer Mm -hmm. and it's been a while. (laughs) Um, But, you know, I mean, even then, 
if you want to create a course, I mean, are you going to create a course so that somebody can feel more fit or are you going to create a course so that somebody can do a 50 pushups? Mm. I mean, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm bringing it into, you know, it doesn't matter what arena it is. If we can create an end goal and feel like we can confidently get our students to that goal, then we can build the structure that is required by figuring out where we're starting them from. <laughs> Awesome. And would I be right in saying that comes down to market research as well, right? When you're doing your market research for the topic idea, you know, okay, cool. What do these people want? Where are they at? What's what's your take on that? Yeah. Yeah. Definitely some of that is more, you know, with the market research, you're figuring out what their struggles are, where they feel that they're not good enough. And then you can pluck something from that or where they're aspiring to go to. I mean, like if somebody's like, I want to be able to play the jam session, the open mic night, yeah. like, and that's their goal. You can kind of see where the commonalities are and say, okay, I've had enough of a critical mass that all wants to be able to perform on the guitar in some way okay, I'm going to get them to a point where they can read sheet music so that they can practice and be able to perform. That could be what it is. Or you could do have that same done that exact same market research and say, I'm going to help them read tab so that they can, you know, do the tablature and get there. So like that's two different courses mm. that are going to get the student to the ultimately to the same goal. Gotcha. So you get, you kind of have, have an option once you know where the market is taking you to how you want to get them there. Gotcha. All right, cool. What's the third thing? So now we've, we've done our market research. Uh, we know where we want to take the person. What's the next thing we do as a course creator? The next thing, hmm, there's like 14 different things we could <laughs> be doing. Um, we want to, on one side of things, say kind of pre-announce the course mm -hmm. that we're going to be creating so that we can start to create an interest list so that we can possibly pre-sell our course and all of those things. So growing an email list and nurturing that and doing social media and all of that kind of thing. And the other is to develop the curriculum, is to develop the, the student journey. Um, I like to think of this as, you know, we've got our end goal, but we have milestones we want to make sure that every student is as excited about the on-ramp to the to the milestone as they are to the off-ramp and that they want to get on the next on-ramp. And the, I use this visualization of up and down, and up and down, and those become your modules. Those become the d bits and pieces. If someone feels like they finish module two, and they're like super excited. There's they they know that they have been able to accomplish it. They're far more likely to go to module three. Mm -hmm. But if someone says, "Okay, module two taught me this, this, and this," and there was not an accomplishment at the end of that milestone, how likely are they going to go to module three? Mm -hmm. Not quite as likely because they don't see themselves on a journey. They see themselves like just slogging along. I think of like college textbooks when you just like have to go through chapter after chapter after chapter, we got to make it exciting because people, especially in industries like, you know, like fitness, like music, like art that are hobbies or they're like personal interest and they're not something that you have to do for work. Mm -hmm. You have to choose every single time someone's going to sit down to your course, they're choosing to take your course. So I spend a lot of time making sure that when we build out our curriculum, we build excitement into it. So like that, that's, that's a place where I like to spend a lot of my time. And that's mm -hmm. part of the reason why I have a business partner that I work on with my program, because she likes the social media side. <laughs> gotcha. In terms of like uh, the listeners for this, do you recommend they work on one first or they do both simultaneously in terms of like, you know, the, do, do we build our social media and pre-announce it at that? Or do we build our course first or do we do them simultaneously? What do you, what do you kind of? Simultaneously. I think mm -hmm. that there is the, you know, there's a wonderful thing on social media where you can share behind the scenes. You can mm -hmm. share things that are in progress and it helps you become 
a household name. It helps you become relatable. It helps people have excitement for what you're creating. So when you're creating it and you're like, I just came up with the coolest exercise for my students to do in this course, and you share it out and you share a little bit about it, it, it it's a winning proposition. So I think that at this point, yes, creating the course curriculum, not the videos, not the handouts, not all the exercises and things like that, but the design of the course, what is going to go into it? How are you going to have the students be excited? Because that that plays really well into the social media, into that growth strategy. Gotcha. All right. Well, let's get into not so much the curriculum side of things, but let's let's say the the course development side of things. Mm -hmm. Let's start, let's start software. What kind of software do most um, music teachers need? And we'll just speak here about the actual course as opposed okay. to like the marketing side of things. That works for me because that's <laughs> where that's where I spend my time. I am a Thinkific fan. Okay. Uh, Thinkific is the course platform that I recommend. I have been a Thinkific expert ever since they started their program back in 2016, I think it was. So I've got a lot of experience on that platform. I like it because your payments are integrated with mm -hmm. your course delivery. So the closer you can have a student paying to the access that they need, the better. They've also done a lot of really great things with their integrations, with their mm -hmm. sales pages, with their content upload. And I love the fact that your video hosting is right in there as well okay. as any other content that you are doing. Yeah. Um, at this point in time, that's, it is for the learning management side of things and the payments and even community, building a community for your course. It is kind of the, the one-stop shop. Um, and then beyond that, I integrate with email marketing. Those are, you know, and for email marketing, I recommend ConvertKit. That is the one that I have decided has the best interest at heart for music teachers because they have really tapped into wanting to work with creatives. And mm -hmm. so they've created more resources that music teachers feel like, oh, this was created for me. So those are the two pieces of software that that I basically recommend to every one of my clients. Okay. Hardware. Would you have a mic you recommend Hardware. or do you need multiple mics and cameras and what do we use then as a, and I'm, I know the answer is probably going to be, it depends, but just give us kind of your, and maybe, maybe budget yeah. as well. If you're starting off here, yeah. you know, you want to go a bit more here, share your thoughts there and we'll, we'll, we'll go from there. Yeah. So I, I am a fan of the, of the ATR 2100 and the sure, I can't remember what version it is. Cause those are the, that's the other one that I recommend and I, uh, for microphones. And the reason why I like these ones is because they are, they pick up whatever's right in front of them. A, a Yeti microphone, like, you know, is a great microphone for a lot of things, but it is a condenser mic. And what it does is it picks up ambient noise. And so if you had somebody running a lawnmower outside or your computer fan was really loud, the Yeti is more likely to say, oh, this is important sound, whereas both the, the ATR and the Shure mic um, are going to be like, oh, no, no, that wasn't sent to me. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't a directional microphone need. Um, I do think that it's really important to have high quality audio mm. more so than video. Like yeah. you can get away with not quite as crisp video. But I still think you should have an external camera for that. But audio is is super, super important because especially with music, of course, mm. we want to make sure that it comes through and it gets recorded properly. Um, and so the other thing with respect to recording audio is to record it as natively as possible. So what I mean by that is if you have a program on your computer that takes 100% of the audio, doesn't do any compression or anything else like that, you're going to have a better quality sound than if you use something that condenses it and then you have to go into editing and it it kind of makes it fuzzy and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, with respect to musical instruments, 
we're going to also want to mic up the instrument. Or if you've got, um, if you've got hardware or, you know, if you've got electric, um, instruments, if you're, if you're using an electric instrument, making sure that you've got the, imp the output of that sound coming from like through the amp or, you know, or all of that stuff so that you can have the purest kind of sound possible. Um, because the last thing you want is for to be teaching a, a beautiful sound and to come across tinny or, or hollow or, um, or garbled or anything like that. So again, like, because I work with music teachers so much, the audio is so, so important. Yes. With respect to video, can we just touch on um, audio a sec? Just, just yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Um, the listeners may yeah. not be that into audio, right? So I'll just kind of break that down a little <laughs> bit. So uh, Jamie mentioned a few microphones there. We'll just run with the two. There was the ATR twenty one hundred and the Blue mm -hmm. Yeti. So I'm a Blue Yeti guy because I don't really deal with music teachers, right? I'm, I use it for <laughs> a course creation podcast. That's what I'm using at the moment. And that's kind of the popular, mm -hmm. that's kind of the generic one, I guess. I think that's the one you you kind of hear most of in general. Hey, you know, I'm creating the course. What's a mic? Blue Yeti. Blue Yeti is about 150 to 200 last time I checked. Is yep. the ATR more than that? $89 when I bought it. No. When I bought my ATR ATR twenty one hundred, it was like eighty nine dollars off this of in Amazon. The 90s or was this in the nineties? You bought it or <laughs> no? Actually, I am using my second ATR twenty one hundred uh, because the first one I broke because <laughs> I was carrying it with me all over the place, and I think I probably bought this one three years ago. Okay, so yeah, there we go. not so not it's that probably long even ago. More affordable. It's probably much the same, if not a little bit more affordable than the Blue Yeti. Yeah. I, you know what? Yeah. I think that, I think that they, they're all kind of comparable. You're going to want to put your microphone on a stand. So mm -hmm. the Yeti comes with a stand. Yeah. The ATR, the stand is so feeble. Like you have yeah. to buy your own, you have to buy, buy a desktop stand or, or some kind of clamp or something like that. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing you want to think about is if you are really animated and things like that, and you're not going to be right next to the mic, you're going to want to use a lapel mic of some kind yep. that you can clip on so that you can have the purest of sound coming as to the microphone as possible. That's a similar one to fitness because mm -hmm. I'm doing push-ups. I can't use this blue Yeti mic on the, the stand, you know? Um, Absolutely. The best, best lapel mic I found is the Rode Go. Amazing mm -hmm. quality. Um, but I think it's around 250, 300. So, yep. you know, you got to kind of, it's not, not, not as much of a throwaway, you know, 89 bucks for an ATR done, you know, 300 totally. for a road go. Do I really need it? But anyway, I'm going to leave that up to the, you know, the, <laughs> the user, but what I can vouch for is amazing quality. I did a live video fitness video yesterday, super windy here in, in Sydney. Couldn't even hear the wind. That's great. Yeah. Which yeah. is amazing. Um, yeah. And you, you also mentioned a microphone specifically for the instrument. So you'd potentially say have two mics. Maybe you've got one and you're on the piano or whatever. You've got one lapel mic maybe for you and then one, you know, ATR yeah. for the, the piano or whatever. That's how you, you do that? That's how I recommend if you're creating a course that, that the sound that you have to create is you don't, you don't want to have the sound um, messed with as much, yeah. as much as possible. You want to get as pure a sound as you possibly can as easily as possible. And that's generally more than one microphone and then um, mixing it all up afterwards and getting everything working together afterwards. And I mean, that's, I think probably the thing that can take time mm. is figuring out what does it look like for me to have, what does my polished product look like? Um, because we want to make sure that it looks good, but we also don't want you spending 40 hours on a 20 minute video. Mm. So you have to balance it out. Um, and sometimes I have clients who they will record their audio from their instrument or they'll record the instrument and what they want to have played. They have that. And then they just um, go back over it and do a voiceover yeah. or, you know, or they cut things apart and insert their, their, their voice, um, in the instructional part. So you could get away with just having a single microphone. Gotcha. 
All right. I think you were going to get into the video side of things before I interrupted. Yeah, I was. So, you know, at this point in time, a lot of computers come with really good cameras. Mm. A lot of phones come with really good cameras. Mm. And I think that the camera that you use, whether you're using the internal camera, you're using your phone camera, you're using an external camera. I'm using a Logitech um, 1080 you know, camera. It's not an ex- overly expensive camera. I think this one was was easily under $200 on Amazon a year and a half ago, like maybe early 2021, something like that. And, or, or if you're using like a digital SLR, that's like really high quality, the video, it's going to be good enough for a course mm. at the level of what most of us are creating whatever tool you're using is good enough. The thing is, just like I said that with the microphone, that it needs to be on a stand, your video needs to be at the right height and at the right angle. Nobody wants to see up your nose or down your nose. Nobody wants to see you from an angle unless they need to see you from an angle. You want to work on making sure that the camera is positioned the best way possible and that you understand how that camera works. I mean, like the camera that I'm using right now, you don't see it because this is audio, but I turned off the setting for it to follow my voice because I'm very animated with my hands. And I, I, I could have like, I could have the camera moving from side to side. If I, if I step away from the microphone or things like that, then like the camera would follow my face. Um, I don't want the camera to follow my face when I'm creating a video for a course. So I want to make sure that I have those settings. It's really, a really much more about understanding how the camera works and getting the angle to what you want it to be um, far more so than the equipment itself. Gotcha. Makes sense. Uh, My final question, Jamie, is around pricing. Now, this is always a tricky one because there's so many variables, uh, but it's also Mm -hmm. a common one as well. You know, what should I charge for my course? Now, I know the answer is going to be, it depends, but if you could give us maybe <laughs> some some indications in the you know, the kind of music space, what prices have you seen? What do you recommend? Yep. What differentiates, you know, a um, a course that, you know, it costs less and what differentiates a course that costs more? What can you tell us about pricing? Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, it kind of goes back to where are you at uh, in your own mm. teaching journey? Do people pay you $25 an hour? Do they pay you $25 a half hour? Do they pay you $400 an hour? Like price anchoring is the first variable. So whatever you charge for your private one-on-one teaching is your first price anchor. So let's say that you charge for easy math, $100 an hour. Okay. You charge $100 an hour. Most of your students see you on a weekly basis. They're paying $400 a month. Then you say, okay, well, my course replaces Mm. three months worth of content. If I did that in a private lesson, it would be a $1,200 value. Okay. Now we've got some really good price anchors. Mm. We know we have our hundred dollars. We have our 400 and we have our 1200. So now we can find a happy medium. Maybe we say, okay, well, for the price of just one month of private lessons, Mm. you can get this whole course, which is going to take you through the content required of three. So $400 is the price point that that you do. Or you could also say for the, for the value of $1,200, which is how much it would be, or the amount of content you're going to learn, the, this course is going to be $550. You know, I mean, it's, it's less than half the cost. So you can kind of frame it in any way, shape or form. Most of the time we're shy and we're scared to charge too much because we don't want to come across greedy and we don't want to come across as unaffordable. So a lot of my clients we do a graduated pricing. We do a course launch price or we do a beta price or a pre-launch price. And so we can build up to what our true price is. I like to see courses that take somebody through two or more steps on their journey to be in the like $800 range. Um, But we don't have to get there right away. I have a client who was, who was teaching creative cello in, you know, in his course and his students were much more advanced Mm. cellists. 
And for them, $800 was like a perfect happy medium. Mm -hmm. And the students who got in at the 600 price point, they were very happy because they knew that the value that they got was well more, way more than what they, what they paid. So if you have a price anchor that you're already, that you've got a published price, yep. start with that and figure out what the value is and how it relates. It's the best piece of advice. The only other thing I would say, don't give away your course for free. You are worth it. Mm -hmm. Don't give away your course because we want you to make a profit from this course and love delivering the course, love promoting the course, love working with the students who come out of that course in some other capacity. So I don't like courses that are under 200 ish, like 197. That's kind of like my bare minimum that I'm willing to like, let a client go with because their value is just so much more. Love it. Yes. I think that's, that's awesome. That's, I love those price anchors. Cause I think a lot of people, if they're not in the music space, they just need to kind of make up a number, you know? Oh, what am I doing? Oh, this looks about right. I saw someone do this. Maybe people pay for this. Maybe I'll pay for that. Um, but with that anchoring, you've actually got something in there. And I like that mm -hmm. as well. Cause it, it goes similar to um, fitness as well in a different mm -hmm. kind of way. But like, usually if you're a, a personal trainer, it might be the same kind of thing, right? You know, I run on one-on-one -on -one sessions are a hundred bucks, you know, or you can right. do my boot camp, you know, which is there's many people in there, but it's 50 bucks, you know, for, right. bucks per week, you know, um, or you can do my, my online program. Okay. I'm not there, but all the workouts that are there, it's 30 bucks per week. So you've kind of got different kind of levels there. And then it can be up to the client, you know, Oh yeah, I'll start with this online one. Oh no, you know what? I need a bit more support. I'll do one-on-one -on -one. or the other way. Do you know, I like this one-on-one -on -one stuff, but you know, I can't keep forking out this, this, you know, hundred bucks a week for the rest of my life. You know, what else have you got? Okay, cool. Here are the options here. So I like, I like that there. Um, and I also like the, the launch side of things because it can kind of like, give you feedback as well. It's like, all right, cool. You know, I did it and people bought it for $500. You know what? The next time I'm going to do it for $600. Oh, sweet. The yep. next time I'm going to do it for $700. And also I think that's a good marketing tool as well. You can kind of put it in your marketing where it's like, hey, mm -hmm. you know, full price is a thousand bucks, but the first 10 people get it at 500. And then the right. next next month, you know, hey, it's a thousand bucks. You know, I've got all you know, uh, first next 10 people will get it at 600. You know, then after that, mm -hmm. next 10, and you can kind of, it also adds that urgency where it's like, oh, I saw it at 500, now it's 600. I better get in now before he gives it to 700, you know? And then you yeah, can yeah. get in there. So I, I love that. Um, but hey, Jamie, that's all we got time for today. I know there's going to be a <laughs> lot of people watching this, listening to this that are like, okay, you know, this woman's cool. I'm going to check out her podcast, the Music Teachers Expand Online Podcast. Uh, what about social media? If someone just wants to follow you on, on social. Where's the best place to go? Uh, you know, Instagram is where I produce most of my content and I am Jamie Slutsky over on Instagram. That's J-A-I-M-E-S-L-U-T-Z or Z in your case, K-Y. Um, and um, I will make sure that you have that correct in your show notes. Um, but Jamie Slutsky on Instagram and feel free to reach out to me on Facebook as well. I think I am the only Jamie Slutsky on there, which I guess is kind of helpful. There we go. Much like me. I don't know how many John O'Petrahiloses there are on, on Facebook, but I know it's not many. <laughs> um, exactly. Awesome. Well, that's all I wanted to cover. Jamie, is there anything I should have asked you but forgot to or anything you want to finish us off with? I just want to say that we all have a lot of amazing course ideas in us. Start with one. Mm. don't say that there are, oh, well, there's these four people who all had these similar ideas. I could create courses for all of them. Mm. The idea with creating a course is to sell a one to many product. So mm. start with one. Love it. Awesome. All right, Jamie, thank you for your time. Thank you.